Okay, uh, so welcome uh, to this uh, webinar entitled Empowerment or Securitization para Diplomacy, Autonomy and Minority Communities. This is part of a webinar series on South Tyrol autonomy that is organized by EURAC Research together with the Center for Autonomy Experience and the South Tyrolean Society for Political Science. This is a webinar series organized in light of the 50th anniversary of the South Tyrolean Second Start of Autonomy, which is a, this sophisticated power sharing system that has been put in place in South Tyrol to regulate, to manage the tension were present in this province of Italy during the 1560s and which has uh, as a system that has um, uh, released the tension and brought peaceful cohabitation between uh, among the South Tyrolean linguistic groups, Italian, German, and Latin, and usually consider a positive example of uh, to manage ethnic tension. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Andrea Carla. I'm a senior researcher at the Institute of my, for Minority Rights of Iraq Research. I'm also a member of the Jean Monnet Network Secureo, the Securitization of Migrants and Ethnic Minorities and the Rise of, of Xenophobia in the EU. Uh, let me clarify, this uh, webinar has been mainly taught and organized by uh, my colleague at the Institute for Minority Rights, Alice Engel, but unlikely she got sick and uh, she cannot participate in this uh, webinar today, but hopefully she is following us. Uh, so I will act as both the chair and discussant of this webinar. I will also like to thank you, Sergio Constantin, my colleague, as well as uh, Teresia Morandel, which are working behind the curtain to make this uh, webinar possible. So the goal of this webinar uh, was to, to focus, the aim was to provide a comparative insight into processes of empowerment and securitization in minority contexts and to understand the extent to which these processes intersect with interstate relations and sub-state cross-border cooperation activities. So we will provide insight in a comparative perspective from looking at case study like Baltic states, Romania, Catalonia, and the Basque country. Also, we hope during the discussion, we also may make some references to past and recent development in South Tyrol. We have a really exciting lineup of speakers. We have uh, started with uh, Noe Cornago from the University of the Basque Country, who is going to speak about uh, from empowerment to securitization, common origins and diverging trajectories in the international assertion of Catalonia and the Basque Country. Thereafter, we have Cristina Callas from the University of Tartu. Who will, she will speak on the Russian question in the Baltic state, nation building and minority empowerment in securitized environment. Uh, let me just mention that Christina Kala is connecting from the airport, so hopefully you will, if you see someone be moving behind her, there is no problem at all. And finally, last but not least, we have Andrea Udrea from the University of Glasgow, who will, she will present on Between Justice, Security and Politics, the Accommodation of the Hungarian Minority in Romania. A few words on the structure of this webinar. So our speaker will have more or less, will have 10 minutes to make a first introduction to their topic, uh, or the first introduction of their perspective. Uh, so after 10 minutes, uh, I will uh, invite them to move towards the end of the presentation. Thereafter, we will have uh, a 15 minutes discussion among the panelists and with myself. So in this case, in this moment, uh, our speaker will, will uh, could further elaborate their thoughts. Also, will, uh, it's an occasion for them to comment on each other, present on each other presentations. And finally, we'll have probably at least uh, 30 minutes or half hour for a Q&A section. And let me remind you also that this webinar is going to be recorded. So uh, we start uh, the, pre the, the presentation with Noe. Uh, let me just give you a brief uh, uh, biographical information about Noe. So Noe Cornago is Associate Professor of International Law and International Relations at the University of the Basque Country in Bilbao and former director of its graduate study program in international studies. His research, his research interests are focused on past and present transformation of diplomacy, all the new para-diplomacies, uh, global regulation, critical sociology of knowledge, post-development, and aesthetic and politics. He was a visiting scholar in several universities, from Ohio State University, University of Ottawa, University, Université Laval in Quebec, Saint-Paul in Bordeaux, 
Saint Anthony College, University of Oxford, and more recently in uh, Sciences Po Paris. He's, he was also scientific director of Teonati International Institute for the Sociology of Law. He has promoted a number of decentralized partnerships with various UN institutions and collaborated with the Council of Europe on matters related to interregional cooperation. Is the, among his several works, is the author of the book Plural Diplomacies, Normative Predicaments and the Functional Imperatives, published by Brill. No, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, thank you very much to the whole team uh, behind uh, this event. I, I, I appreciate very much this invitation. Um, in addition to be an opportunity you know, to meet other colleagues and, and listen and learn a lot of about other experiences allows me to, to, I would say, to revise a little bit the way in which I used to approach the subjects we are interested in in this particular session. So first, I would like to say that uh, being my case, you no, know, a sort of comparison between Catalonia and the Basque Country uh, through the lenses you know, of this idea of empowerment, of uh, self-government, self-rule, but also securitization, and also in the, with that consideration, not only of the domestic political process, but, al but also the wider European context, uh, I would like to underline that there are only a few, very few uh, comparisons, systematic comparisons between Catalonia and the Basque Country. There is, there are a lot of bibliography on, on both cases, but it's quite rare, the, the comparison of both. Um, and this PowerPoint is a quite brief, uh, I hope, presentation of 10 minutes, probably less than 15 for sure. But I try to summarize basically the big picture, well understood that if later anyone in the audience or with participants have some curiosity or some specific question about some specific detail or precision, uh, of course, I am willing not to offer all this, but I, 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 I thought that it could be better to try to send you a clear message no, about how these things have evolved. I will begin saying that the Basque country and Catalonia have plenty of historical commonalities, uh, also similarities today, no? but these uh, historical commonalities are particularly interesting from the point of view, at least of a few uh, elements. No? The first one is, of course, and it is to say, is a widely expressed sense of belonging to a differentiated collective identity due basically to the existence of a distinctive language and culture, but also to a shared uh, historical experience, uh, basically vis-a-vis -vis the wider political context and the wider Spanish context. From this point of view, this is a similarity which is shared also, for instance, with Galicia, but in never in Galicia, in Spain, the, the, I would say the, the development of a sense of a, a collective identity, a sense of difference, uh, collective identity has been so powerful as as was. No, finally, in the Basque Country in Catalonia, even if uh, I would say nationalism in Galicia has been. Uh, for a long time, a, a quite important influential political force, but never, never, I would say, majority. A second element which is also important to underline is that both the Basque Country and Catalonia have a long historical tradition of self-rule and self-governing institutions. But interestingly, uh, it is not the, the case of uh, being, I would say, former kingdoms or states always they have these forms of autonomy and self-rule uh, under a sort of compromise within a wider political system. Basically, the Spanish political system or the French political system understood as if both systems have evolved across centuries. So this sort of uh, historical compromise between uh, Basque and Catalan autonomy or self-rule and around institutions across centuries has shaped a very uh, peculiar dimension of Basque and Catalan nationalism. Another thing which uh, they share, which is also very influential, no, is a real explanatory element on this, is the idea that um, despite enjoying these forms of self-rule and, and autonomous institutions for centuries, they experience in different historical moments uh, attempts to radical abolition of this uh, autonomy or modifications that uh, I would say empty of substance, no, these, these institutions. And this happens basically, historically, and particularly in the context from, of the transition from, from 
absolutism to liberal monarchies, because basically these forms of self-rule were increasingly incompatible with uh, liberal monarchies' understanding of a new uh, liberal monarchy in which all privileges uh, belong no, to uh, the ancient regime. So in the case of Spain, where the so-called Carlist wars, no, wars of, uh, of succession within the Spanish uh, uh, so within, sorry, between different dynasties, but it, it, it were the historical moments in which both Catalans and Basques lost the most, um, I would say, important institutions for them, basically what we call the fuero. That means the special law and a special legal status for Basques and Catalan and for the Basque and Catalan territories uh, within the wider configurations of a Spanish state. Uh, and not only during the unification of the Spanish monarchy, but also before uh, they, they have a peculiar status as well. And of course, in addition to this, this historical precedence, which shape narratives about the uh, grievance and about the uh, suffering no, of discrimination and loss you know, of autonomy, um, also, of course, was very important the experience in the 20th century of the Spanish uh, dictatorship you know, after the civil war, the end of the Republic and the Franco dictatorship for 40 years. So this is something important, even of course in the political imaginaries of both Basque and Catalan nationalists uh, exist. The idea, for instance, that the Euskal Herria, which is the big Basque country, which uh, is, is Iparralde, which is in the French side of the border, no? and Egoalde, which is the south side of the Basque country, uh, historically was a sort of, a, I would say, uh, successor of the old uh, kingdom of Navarra. Uh, in the case of Catalonia, it's slightly different because it's more complicated to trace back to history, a, a continuity you know, with the very existence of our sort of Catalan, Catalan kingdom, but there are some fleeting in time experiences of assertion you know, of this, uh, the visibility of Catalonia as something distinctive of Aragon and something distinctive also from the rest of Spain. A third point, which is important to emphasize, particularly in terms of how to understand the, the rise of modern nationalism in the end of the 19th century and during the, 50, uh, the first half no, of, the, of the 20th century, is that both regions have been particularly resourceful and industrious and with a big tradition in terms of a merchant uh, trade, investment, uh, this kind of things. So they have an international outreach. They were, they had their own specific buzz and I would say Catalan articulations with a wider international real in different historical stages. But also as a result of this uh, industrialization and modernization of these uh, regions, this, both regions have had the experience of immigration, particularly immigration coming from other areas of Spain, particularly more uh, poor, uh, areas of Spain. So the combination of these distinctive cultures with the arrival no, of migrants coming from other parts of Spain was also on the basis of the rise of modern nationalism. There are other elements of in common. Uh, as I forgot to mention, of course, that in the case of Catalonia, there is also this dimension of being Catalonia something which exists also at the other cross of the border no, and on the other side of the border in France. So this will be the the the, the países catalans, no, the, the the Catalan countries, no, in Spain and, this, and divided, no, by the French and Spanish sovereignty. Another thing that I would like to emphasize is that the, when it comes to discuss the basics of Basque and Catalan paradiplomacies, something which distinguishes Basque and Catalan diplomacies, paradiplomacies, sorry, from many other paradiplomacies all over the world and also in Europe is that the experience that, that this both regions uh, have, particularly in terms of institutional profile, no, the very existence of a Basque government and a Catalan government in a contemporary sense of the word, uh, dates back from the civil war, because it was during the Spanish Second Republic uh, between uh, in 1932 and 1939, after the end of the war, the civil war, that both the Catalan Statute of Autonomy in 1933 and the Basque Statute of Autonomy in 1936 was uh, approved uh, 
uh, as a sort of compromise of Republican forces, yeah. no, to to recognize uh, Catalan uh, and Basque vindications, also for Galicia, and they were negotiating also a similar status of autonomy with Aragon. But the fact remains that only Catalonia and the Basque country uh, and Galicia, that's true, uh, have this historical precedence. And after the civil war, as a result of the Franco dictatorship, they went both into exile. And this creates a singularity, which is that for four centuries, for four decades, sorry, for four decades, Basque government in exile, and in less extent or with less intensity, Catalan government in exile, have very salient international relations. Very important relations, not only in terms of very symbolic recognition, in terms of uh, they, they were, for instance, part of the creation of the International uh, Christian Democrat uh, uh, Party uh, coalition in Europe. They were very active, uh, negotiating directly with embassies all over the world. It's, the Basque government has even delegations, and uh, not only in France, in UK, but also in the United States, in Mexico, in Venezuela, in many countries all over the world. And for instance, these three pictures, you know, the one is Jose Antonio Aguirre, which was the, the Basque president, you know, the first Lendakari, we say in Basque language, you know, president. And in his, uh, in his office, in the official delegation of the Basque country in exile in Paris. Yeah. This is the building, which uh, after, in the 50s, no French, uh, France, uh, French government, sorry, uh, in, in order to normalize their relationship with with Franco Spain, with Franco's Spain, they uh, they delivered this building to the Spanish state. And even today, the Spanish government is reluctant, no matter the pol the color the, or the political party in office, to to I will say to to return this building for the Basque Country to establish their the recovery you know, of his old official delegation in Paris. So this is a contention, a symbolic political contention that the Basque uh, nationalists are still having uh, with uh, Spanish uh, nationwide political parties, socialists and, and, and conservatives. <clears throat> so I would say that after transition to democracy or during transition to democracy, uh, they were also expectant, no, not only of the recovery of self-government, but also very proud of the opportunity to be uh, able uh, and, and willing to, to to act no, in, in the European wider political space. Um, for them, it was not only important in terms of the, I would say, the, the external dimensions of their own recovery of powers. No? For instance, full competences, full powers, for instance, in the case of education, full powers, for instance, in many other technical fields, for instance, fisheries, for instance. Uh, in the case of the Basque country, no fiscal autonomy, which is an extremely singular element also, no, with a Catalan doesn't have a Catalan autonomy. But both because of this pragmatic uh, care no, about uh, how to care of these new powers, no, the new Basque government and Catalan government, but also uh, eager to, to be there and to be able to represent symbolically what means to be Catalonia or Basque country as something different to Spain, both Basque and Catalan government, uh, I would say, dedicate a lot of resources and efforts and imagination to display you know, a presence abroad. Hey, so, no, if I can invite you to move on. Yes, yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so they basically did what many others did, no? Foreign trade and foreign investment promotion, uh, delegations abroad and many other things. But uh, the, the interesting thing is that this has been a quite contentious process, not necessarily conflicting process or conflict, conflictual process, but it was always submitted to the ultimate political needs of the central government. When the central government was governing with absolute majority, expectations for increasing, I would say, the scope of Basque and Catalan recognition abroad uh, diminished. And when the uh, central government needs the support of Catalan and Basque MPs, and this is still ha happening today, of course, they, the central government were much more willing to offer you know, some, some concessions, some side payments to, to this collaboration by the side of Catalans and Basque. And this is a bad thing because that means that compared with other states, for instance, uh, Germany or Austria or Switzerland or, or Canada or even United States all over the world, a Spanish intergovernmental system, formal and informal venues for intergovernmental dialogue and negotiation and cooperation are really poorly designed and very bad performing. 
uh, from this point of view, most uh, contentious elements in this uh, in this uh, uh, in this history, I'm telling you, um, are basically the result of the ultimate reluctance of the Spanish government or the party in office in the Spanish government to offer any concession unless it's strictly necessary for passing, for instance, the budget every year or this kind of uh, imperatives no, in the Spanish Congress. So um, I conclude uh, very soon. Uh, in terms of the past para diplomacy, what has been basically non-conflictual, even if we have during the Ibarreche uh, three terms, a very singular project, which was the um, President Ivarece, the attempt to, to, to modify the constitutional status of, his, of the Basque country as an autonomous community into a free state freely associated to another state which will be Spain, a sort of pact between sovereigns instead of a sort of uh, subordinated, no, belonging to the Spanish uh, sovereignty. But the Ivarece project um, anticipate, I will say, that prepares the ground because it serves to, to show the limits, to test the limits of a Spanish constitutional system and political forces to assert wider political recognition and, of course, any attempt of secession or, or self-determination. So what happens, of course, is that it was in the Catalan process, uh, the decade afterwards, when this began as a sort of medium high conflict and finally in the context of the declaration of independence that was declared in constitution and not by the spanish constitutional court it was a very important political radicalization in which uh, catalonia steps into porroto diplomacy overly across the world no defending the the, the legitimacy and even legality of uh, an unilateral secession and this was quite conflicting as you know with plenty of consequences and also very important personal cost for those politicians involved directly on this but as a way of concluding this, uh, I will try to offer you two ideas to retain. The first is with regard to the Catalan case. The, my conclusion about this is that perhaps the Catalan case reveals that uh, this audacious move towards unilateral uh, secession and also to enter in an over proto diplomacy, even entering in cover operations, not trying to secure support, no, gather support from different uh, nations from all over the world, uh, contracting international lobbies no, for, 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 for opening spaces and so on. Uh, of course, uh, it works very well in the sense of really, in terms of the social semiosis, no, the, the political significance of the Catalan vindication, which um, won no, TV headlines and all over the world. But at the end, because of the, the audacious yeah. move, it was has been, I would say, detrimental in, in the sense of uh, what is the international branding of Catalonia today, what could be the, the, the potential for Catalonia to recover no, the position they have unless un, until simply, I would say, uh, 10 or 12 years ago. So from this point of view, in a very complex political situation, the Catalan leaders today are trying to recover a sort of pragmatism and to escape from isolation. So I would say this is an important thing to retain. And in the case of the Basque country, paradoxically, is the opposite, because, for instance, now Catalonia is, is, is involved in sort of a espionage uh, complot, no, you probably you are aware of this. So securitization is securitization of the Catalan thing is becoming now salient, just in the moment in which the Basque country has finally uh, take distance of uh, terrorism, it, uh, is, is the past. And now, in terms of securitization, the situation in the Basque country is better than ever. Never the Basque country has farther from securitization and whatever wider understanding we could understand this than today. So it's, it's paradoxical, this evolution, and this was the reason why I say at the beginning, no common origins, but divergent trajectories. Thank you very much. Thank you, Noe. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this really interesting presentation. Uh, let me just remind to, to whoever is listening to the webinar that uh, you can write uh, any questions uh, for in the, in the chat and we'll, uh, we will uh, look at your question and we'll have at the end a Q&A question. So now we move on with uh, Christina presentation by Christina Callas. Uh, just to be fair, uh, Christina and as well Andrea, feel free to speak a bit more than the 10 minutes uh, originally planned. Uh, just let's try to keep as much possible, as much time as possible for a discussion and the Q and A after. So, Christina Callas is a research fellow at Tartu University Narva College. 
Her main research work focuses on the question of Russian-speaking population outside of the Russian Federation after the collapse of the Soviet Union, mainly in Estonia and Latvia. She has researched the question of securitization of the minority, the issue of identity and belonging, of language, citizenship, and education of the Russian speakers. She is an expert consultant for OSHA High Commission on National Minorities for Ukraine, Moldova, and Kyrgyzstan. And previously, she has uh, worked as a researcher in the Faculty of the Political Science of the University of Tartu. She was a policy analyst in the Institute of Baltic Study in Tartu and uh, consultant for Estonian government on national integration strategy, as well as director of Tartu University in Narva College. She also not only an academic, but also, I would say, a practitioner, or, because she is uh, the leader of the new liberal political party, AST 200 in Estonia. Please, Christina. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, my favorite topic, topic, of course, is the Russian question in the Baltic states. I, I call it the Russian question with the capital letters because it's, it's one of the um, major questions in geopolitical uh, issues in the North European uh, region. And um, my intervention today will focus not so much about the history of, of this Russian question, but about the present situation, because um, uh, what is happening in Ukraine now is probably uh, causing uh, many European public academics and politicians to ask, but what about, what about the Baltic states and what about the Russians um, in the Baltic states? Uh, and that's why I let's I want to talk about the, the current really very pertinent uh, situation about the Russian the Russian minority in the Baltic states. So I will focus on Estonia and Latvia, although the Baltic states there are three of them, but Lithuania does not really uh, have a Russian minority as such. It's a very tiny group of population, but in Estonia and in Latvia, uh, Russian speakers, which may include also Ukrainians and Belarusians and maybe some other Soviet nationalities, but their common denominator is that they are uh, speaking Russian as a mother tongue. Uh, they constitute around 30% of the population in both countries. So this is a significant one third, one third of each of uh, uh, population of each of those countries of Estonia and Latvia, and these are very small countries, very tiny countries in, in the way of population. And before I go to talk about the securitization and empowerment of, of Russian speakers, I want to clarify one, um, uh, one issue to make it more understanding what is the situation on the ground uh, in those two countries, talking about ethnic tension. Uh, among Russians and Estonians or Russians and Latvians on a grassroots level, on an everyday level, you don't have a uh, ethnic tensions in a classical understanding as, as you have maybe in some other post-Soviet um, uh, regions, for example, like in Central Asia, you have a communal level tensions between Uzbeks and Kyrgyz or, um, or Uzbeks and Uyghurs, but you don't have this kind of inter-ethnic uh, grassroots tensions among the population. Uh, here, uh, what you do have is um, a, a political uh, tension regarding uh, contested issues of uh, power sharing with a minority or questions of the, of the role of the Russian language. And uh, in, in recent years, especially now in the light of uh, uh, Russia's aggression on Ukraine, the main contested debate is about the memory and about the question of uh, Second World War, the role of the Red Army, and the role of Russia uh, at, at that time, Soviet Union, in the question of the occupation of the Baltic states. So there is a big memory conflict and memory wars that are going on. So this is the main, so to say, uh, conflict issue among the Estonian and um, Latvian and Russian speaking populations. Uh, it's actually a memory war, not so much the, the inter-ethnic uh, tensions on, on the community or grassroots level. So, um, I would, I would dare to postulate and say that the Russian speaking minority of Estonia and Latvia is one of the most securitized minority in, in Europe, meaning that uh, the, the whole relationship and the question of the minority empowerment and minority rights in these two countries is embedded in a regional and geopolitical European security uh, question. So in a way, Russian population is, is um, uh, I don't want to say a victim, but I want to say that Russian, the question of the Russian population's rights is entangled in a state security uh, debate 
Um, uh, this means that any debate about the rights of the minority or enlargement of the rights of the minority in any direction immediately uh, enters into the question of the state security. Uh, as an example, whether, whether to allow Russians to study in their own language in schools is not the question of the minority rights. It's not usually the debate about uh, whether this is good or bad for the children. It's the question, if we allow them to study in Russian language in their own schools, how much Russia has then influence on them through this school system? So this is, this is how the uh, political debate is going on. So it's immediately a state security uh, question. It's not the question of the rights of, of those children. So, so the Russian minority rights are in the middle of the state security uh, debate. Uh, in uh, minority leaders, uh, Russian minority leaders in Estonia and Latvia have been linked to the Kin state politically, culturally. So there is this uh, securitization of minority leaders' actions that they are not representing actually the interest of the uh, country that they are born and live in, but they represent the interest of the Kin state. In, in this case, it's Russia. And therefore, uh, their political actions should be limited and controlled because they are. Uh, potentially unloyal and, and, and they have this link to the kin state. And I'm going to make a, a, a quick um, comment about this while, while talking about the current war and how this is impacting this link. So empowerment of, of Russian minority in the Baltic states or any movement towards any autonomy, autonom autonomy rights has been uh, completely blocked by the state security uh, concerns. And this has not been really happening in last uh, 30 years. Uh, uh, years and the thinking among the uh, political establishment in both countries in Estonia and Latvia is that for our state to be strong and secure and for our democracy to be strong and secure we need to make the minority weak so if minority is weak we can build a strong security and, and strong, strong state, state security if minority is strong this means that they have potential destabilizing effect on our democracy because they are linked to Russia and because Russia then has a, uh, access to Estonian democratic, uh, impacting Estonian democratic processes. Um, now, uh, this has been kind of a, a, a frozen securitized situation over the years and over the years the, the Russian minority has, has in a way uh, fought for more like a stabilized agreement. Let's agree that this is how we will proceed. And this agreement has been on place uh, in a way in terms of language, citizenship, uh, and, and, and memory, history about the Second World War until, uh, until Russian aggression against Ukraine happened. And in this situation, uh, what happened after 24th of February in the Baltic states was that the minority question became extremely re-securitized to, to the very extreme uh, level. And that means that um, any discussion about the linguistic rights of the Russian minority, uh, the right of the Russians to celebrate 9th of May and the victorious Red Army, or the questions of citizenship, or even not even citizenship, but the residence rights of the Russians in, in Estonia and Latvia, they have all become an, a question of the political debate. And there are political parties arguing that these need to be restricted. These rights need to be restricted because look what Russia is doing in Ukraine. Russia is, is a threat and the minority is a potential threat for our state security. So one process that is happening after the 24th of February is, is heavy re-securitization of the minority uh, issue, but there is also another process that started after 24th of February, and that's uh, uh, even more interesting maybe. It's the process of detachment of the Russian political elite in Estonia, in Latvia, from Russia as a kin state. So the Russian political leaders, minority leaders, have made in all levels, in all state and national levels, leaders have made very strong statements against the war, against the Russian aggression, and have been distancing themselves strongly from Russia. And that's an interesting phenomenon uh, because by distancing themselves from Russia, uh, I would argue that in the long term, this could lead to desecuritization uh, to some extent of the minority question because this question of the minority leaders linked to Russia has been one of the main uh, securitization tools for the, for, the, for the majority. So if Nils Ushakovs, who used to be the mayor of Riga for many, many years, and, and as a Russian himself was or main organizer of Red Army victory celebrations in, in Riga, 
has made extremely strong statements against Russia, calling Russia an aggressor, saying that this is not acceptable. And, and, uh, and Russians in Latvia even made a public letter saying that they are, they are really ashamed that this kind of behavior is conducted in their own language. So they are ashamed of, of, of the fact that their culture is used um, for this kind of political um, aggression. And this is an interesting process that is currently uh, happening with the, with the elite or so to say political elite of the, of the Russian speaking minority in Estonia and Latvia. Now, where this process will lead or whether we will see uh, desecuritization of the Russian minority question in the Baltic states is, I think, too early to say. Uh, we still need more time to see how the how the developments uh, with uh, detachment from Russia and, and uh, will, will will proceed. And uh, but it's clearly a challenge for Estonia and Latvia in a current situation to continue um, integration and empowerment of the Russian minority because they need to do it in order to for the state security. Uh, purposes. For the state to be secure, the minority need to be content. Uh, for minority need to be content, you need to empower them. To empower them, you actually risk giving them powers that might be used against your state security. So it's, it's a kind of a, a, a walking on the rope uh, challenge uh, for those two countries to, uh, to proceed maybe with the careful steps of empowerment that they have been doing in last uh, maybe 15, 20 years. Uh, but in a highly, uh, highly securitized uh, situation. So, um, and, and in which direction this um, process of Russian minority leaders detaching themselves uh, from Russia, in which direction this will go and, and how, how far this will help the desecuritization of the minority question is, is, is to be seen. So this is just an overview of the situation what we see in, um, in the Baltic states. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Also, thanks for being great in time. But again, we will have more time later on to go further in the details of your, your presentation. So now we move on to our last speaker, uh, Andrea Udrea, who is a visiting lecturer in the Department of Politics, International Relations and Philosophy at Royal Holloway, University of London, and a research associate in the School of Social and Political Science at the University of Glasgow where she convenes the Kimpol Observatory on Kinsnet Policies with Professor David Smith. Dr. Andres' research and teaching reflect a joint interest in international politics and applied political theory with a particular interest in kin state, kin minority relations, international responsibility, ethics in international politics, the policy of recognition and multiculturalism. Among her uh, more recent articles, she has published uh, on uh, in ethnopolitics, ethnicity, and the European Yearbook of Minority Issues. So Andrea is going to present on, as I mentioned before, on a presentation entitled Between Justice, Security, and Politics, the Accommodation of the Hungarian Minority in Romania. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you, Alice, uh, if you're online, for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Today, it is a pleasure and an honor. So my presentation, my short presentation today, will focus on the Hungarian minority in Romania. Um, I do have a couple of slides, so I'm just going to upload them just to be there. Uh, I'm not going to use them at the moment, I'm sorry. To the back, okay. So, uh, in 2001, Will Kim Likar wrote that in Central and Eastern Europe, and I quote, states believe that self-government for minorities poses a threat, end of quotation. And as we heard from Christina's presentation, also in 2022, uh, some states believe the same. A few years later, Kim Likar observed that such security fears have obscure, obscured and distorted fundamental decisions regarding the accommodation of national minorities with dire consequences to justice as well as security. In fact, however, a process of the desecuritization of national minorities in interstate relations have taken place after 2000, which has allowed for the European minority rights regime to strengthen. At the same time, the deepening and widening of the European integration has led to uh, increases in trans-border cooperation, as well as kin-state engagement. 
Overall, however, Kim Lika's argument remains accurate. The history of the Hungarian minority in Romania after the fall of communists illustrates well the impact of the securitization of minority rights upon a dented accommodation of national minorities. In their book, Kish, Sekei and Toro differentiate between two different but complementary dimensions of the minority political agency in Romania, namely political claim making, which refers to aspects including electoral politics, bargaining, as well as advocacy, and community organizing, which refers to different issues pertaining to the institutions that allow for this. I focus here very briefly on the second dimension, namely the institutional dimension of minority political agency, and argue that while national minorities have gradually been empowered in Romania after the fall of communism, the accommodation of the Hungarian minority in particular remains deeply problematic, uh, and specifically in relation to their autonomy. The, sa the status and rights of national minority, <coughs> sorry, uh, minorities continue to be on the whole contentious issues in Romania after 1999, even though the right to parliamentary representation of all national minority groups was constitutionally safeguarded already in 1991. Article 59 of the 1991 Romanian constitution, now Article 62 of the amended one from 2017, guarantees the political representation of national minorities, stating that, and I quote, organizations of citizens belonging to national minorities, which fail to obtain uh, the number of votes for representation in parliament have the right to one deputy seat each under the terms of the electoral law." End of quotation. While until 1996, the majority actively sought to maintain and strengthen their cultural, economic and political dominance, since 1996 provisions scattered in the Romanian law targeting cultural minorities and referring to the use of, use of and education in their mother tongues, and their representation in the parliament and local administration contributed to improve the accommodation of all national minorities. In this period, perhaps the most significant achievement was the amended law on pub local public administration of 2001, which grants, culture, which grants minorities the right to use their languages in public matters if the number of individuals belonging to a minority passes the threshold of 20% of the population of a settlement. A turning point for a prospective improvement in the accommodation of national minorities in Romania is a draft law <coughs> on the status of national minorities, first introduced in the parliament in 2005 and on the table since. The, the draft law lays down a series of cultural, collective and individual rights, which on the one hand refer to cultural reproduction and cultural autonomy, and on the other hand, establish and delimit the powers of institutions and organization, organizations protecting and promoting the culture of minorities. Article 57 defines cultural autonomy as the capacity of a national minority to exercise decision-making powers regarding issues pertaining to its cultural, linguistic and religious identity through councils selected by its own members. According to the draft law, cultural autonomy applies to the following areas, education in minority languages, media, cultural heritage, and the man management of the financial support received from the state. In its opinion from 2005, the Council of Europe states that, and I quote, the form of cultural autonomy contained in, in the draft law would ensure real decision-making powers to the representatives of national minorities, mainly through their binding consent and not just consultation rights as in the case of, uh, in the case in some other countries, end of quotations. Unfortunately, this draft law continues to be under revision and debate. <coughs> Excuse me. It is important to highlight that many scholars remarked that Central and Eastern European states, including Romania, often chose to pursue such policies not as a matter of justice, but viewed them instrumentally beneficial to qualify for the EU membership primarily. In brief, external pressures and domestic political bargaining overwhelmingly defined the nature and extent of Romania's minority accommodation 
uh, policies until today, while broader considerations of justice have been at best secondary. Now, the engagement of the King State, which started in 2001, namely Hungary, has gradually modified the nature of the accommodation of the Hungarian minority uh, and their living conditions. In a forthcoming paper, I show the extent to which the autonomy of the Hungarian minority in Romania is entrenched in a complex nexus of political and economic dependence involving the home state as well as the king state. I argue that the exercise of autonomy in cases such as this one is at odds with the legal and political developments of the idea of autonomy for minority groups in Europe and has not only weakened its normative foundations, but more worryingly made it evanescent. Over the last uh, um, years, in particular, the, the Hungarian minority in Romania uh, has become the main beneficiary of Hungary's king state policies. The policies of the Hungarian government in the last two decades have strengthened the ties between ethnic Hungarians and the current ruling party, Fidesz, and increased the economic dependence of the Transylvanian Hungarians upon their king state. The table on the screen shows the evolution of funding targeting the Hungarian minority in Romania between 1990 and 2015. The funding further increased substantially in the last five years. Since early 2018, the Hungarian minority in Romania is the direct beneficiary of two new government funding initiatives, namely um, the Hungarian uh, government ordinance from 2017 on the assistance offered to the organizations abroad and the Hungarian government ordinance from 2017 on providing the necessary resources for the programs in Transylvania on, an, on ensuring their financial assistance. Moreover, economic cooperation has become a priority of the Orban government since 2017. Most recently, in 2021, the Hungarian government created a new platform for investments in agriculture in the neighboring states. There seems to be a strong agreement among the experts on Hungarian team state policy that from an institutional point of view, Hungary's engagement with the Hungarian minority in Transylvania has been successful. Hungary has managed to create a set of institutions that tie ethnic Hungarians to the Hungarian state, albeit a parallel institutional framework. However, it would be difficult to argue that this amounts to transborder cooperation. The Hungarian king minority remains at the receiving end with no voice in the nature and extent of Hungarian king state policy. The EU program that could, could have promoted, could have boosted or, and would boost transborder cooperation has been so far less, uh, less, successful, uh, less successful, namely Interreg uh, Romania Hungary. The EU, the EU allocated a substantial amount of money um, to promote cooperation between Hungary and Romania starting from 2014. The main priorities of this program have been uh, the following, to protect and promote common values and resources, to improve cross-border mobility and in particular labor mobility, healthcare services, risk prevention, disaster management, as well as to promote cross-border cooperation between citizens and institutions. However, as uh, to the table, the two table, the two, tables on the screen show, uh, overall very little funding was in fact absorbed. To conclude, security fears have distorted the accommodation of national minorities in Central and Eastern Europe, and unfortunately the war in Ukraine has brought them back. National minorities have gradually been empowered in Romania, However, the accommodation of the Hungarian minority has become increasingly disconnected from considerations of multi multicultural justice. Equally worryingly, in the current geopolitical and economic context and with the appropriation of Hungary to Russia, the pivotal role of the king states in ensuring the autonomy and welfare of the Hungarian minority in Romania is becoming a threat rather than a, guarant a guarantee of future well-being. Thank you very much. And I apologize for the quality of uh, these pictures on the screen. It was my best photographic moment. 
No problem, Andrea. They actually, you can read them well. So that is what is most important. So thank you all of you for this uh, really interesting and stimulating presentation. Uh, tackling this, uh, what I will say has been a, a complex title for a webinar that put together a great variety of concepts, empowerment, securitization, paradiplomacy, autonomy, minority. Uh, I'll try, I say, try, I will just try to raise some general questions that we can discuss together. And then later on, we will see the, if there are some uh, more specific questions in the chat. So far, I don't see much. So let me go ahead and try to bring together your presentations uh, as much as possible and raise some questions that you see what you want to tackle. So, uh, we start on the title. I mean, and also again, we developed this webinar also in light of the fifth anniversary of, second of the autonomy in Satoru, which uh, we look at the concept we are in the title, empowerment securitization. We can see Satoru as a positive example of uh, an empowering minority, as well as uh, dealing with securitization minorities, a case of desecretization in terms of empowerment, you know, uh, through the autonomy, the German speaking minority is actually a majority within the territorial framework of the autonomy. It's enough to think that in South Tyrol, the president of the province is, all, is de facto a German speaker. Learning and knowing the German language is extremely important, not just in public institutions, but also in the job market and so on. And regarding desecretization, uh, it's clearly, uh, we can see how in South Tyrol, like the others, whether it's the a community, an Italian community or German speaking community or the Italian state is no longer seen as a threat. Uh, German speaking community has been reassured about the possibility to live and uh, prosper in, uh, in within the Italian state. Uh, and also we have plenty of surveys that show how in South Tyrol people look at the presence of more than a, a linguistic group in South Tyrol as an enrichment, the cultural diversity as an enrichment. But uh, here I'm going coming to some of the questions that try to uh, the South Tyrol autonomy has unfolded, even if not correctly directly correlated related, but has unfolded with the framework of the European Union, as which developed meanwhile. Uh, so, and uh, you touch in your uh, presentation slightly. I mean, it can sometimes some of you more, or some of you less, but something uh, was all all cases within the European Union. Uh, so what is uh, more specifically for uh, Andrea and uh, Christina, was the role of the European Union for key state minorities dynamics and transform not just about uh, protecting minorities with some of you mentioned, but also transform the relation between the all state and the key state. And also for more in general of involving also uh, Noe in these conversations is in the case of uh, Catalonia and Basque country, we, can, we are not speaking of Kingston, what's the role of the European Union in addressing process of empowerment and sectorization of minorities? I see like, in, uh, actually something happened within, if you look at Catalonia and the European Union, with the relation between Catalonia and what to happen with the uh, referendum and self-determination and the European Union, there's been a great uh, role that the European Union has played in these different trajectories that you touch upon in your presentation regarding Catalonia and Basque. So this is one first uh, topic. Another element we are in Satro, which also you mentioned some, uh, somehow in your presentation, I mean, in Satro we have this great investment in discourse and policy regarding trust-border institutions, especially the El Regio, uh, Tirol, South Tirol, Trentino which is, ba is basically seen as the possibility to move on via nation state paradigm, but uh, actually, I'm a bit, also a bit skeptical about this. I really uh, wonder if you can uh, talk, also look at your case studies. What's the other value of cross border cooperation to minority policies, especially when we compare this to keen state policies? Uh, so, to what extent cross border cooperation can create shared spares, shared space where this securitization happens? Well, so, we have an overcoming of the friend enemy logic, the distinction between majority and minorities. Uh, where we can foster uh, multiple membership in overlapping political and cultural communities. But I'm not sure, I'm actually skeptical about the role of these uh, transborder uh, institutions sometimes because uh, the region in South Tyrol, yes, it creates, it's, it's still is an ongoing process. It's still like in the early development, but I don't see having a, a strong impact so far on the society in these terms. Uh, 
I have to also have to ask a clarification because we usually uh, ask, use this term securitization a lot uh, in uh, scholarship, but everybody, I feel like there are different understanding of the concept. I mean, no, you refer, when you mentioned securitization, we were speaking about uh, uh, the violence of uh, ETA in the past. Uh, Christina Callas mentioned about how the leader of minorities have been securitized. But I see, uh, and on the other hand, you also, Christina, referred to the regional security concern that somehow affect the, the approach to minority issues. So I just wonder if you can clarify that a bit. Uh, and uh, something, Christina, if you can reflect with me, because it's something also I wonder, I mean, uh, what, uh, what do we mean exactly with empowering minorities? I was really intrigued by when you, Christina, you mentioned how there's a trade-off between empowerment and securitization. This is what you mentioned. But what do we mean exactly with empowerment? Uh, and uh, going back to my first question, how the European Union or transborder institutions can help us overcome this trade-off between empowerment and securitization? And uh, I stop here. You can tackle any of the issues I raise. I don't know who want to start. I, 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 I can start. I can start. <laughs> um, I, I choose to start from this transborder cooperation because I didn't touch it uh, in my presentation at all. And I tend to share your pessimism about the effect of transborder cooperation on the minority um, empowerment, for example, or desecuritization of the minority <clears throat> issues, at least in the case of the Baltic states um, in this highly geopolitically securitized environment where the kin state of the minority is, is conceptualized clearly as, a, as the, the enemy, the only and the big uh, enemy of the state. Uh, then transborder cooperation is extremely limited and uh, after the 24th of February it does not exist any longer. So there is no transborder cooperation with Russia uh, between Estonia and Russia or Latvia and Russia, everything is stopped. So basically we are in a situation where, where there is a new wall uh, going up along the Estonian Latvian uh, borders uh, with Russia and the minority is minorities in a way stuck uh, in one side of the border and the contacts with kin on the other side of the border become extremely limited. And, and this is what is happening right now. So even if the transborder cooperation existed before with the EU financing, it was very limited to building roads and bridges rather than having cultural or scientific exchange, for example. This was very, very limited in case of, of, of at least in case of Estonia and, and, and Latvia. It's just uh, uh, road connections and, and, and uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe city cooperation uh, across the border, but that was very, very limited uh, cooperation. Now, um, securitization and empowerment, it is indeed a trade-off in, uh, in at least in case of Baltic states, in a way, what I mean by empowerment is that you allow, uh, you, you establish certain rules in the political system of democracy where you allow minority to mobilize and use political power for its own cultural, linguistic, or political interests. So you extend um, um, a political rights based on the minority basis, uh, whether this this cultural autonomy or even regional autonomy rights. So you, you allow minority to handle their own things by themselves. And, and this, this situation of empowerment uh, uh, is something that is seen as, a, as, a, as something that is wishing or something that democracy should develop into. But uh, it's not happening in, uh, in the Baltic states because the argument goes, as I said, you, you give them more rights to decide about their own things somewhere there in Narva. And then they take those rights and use them against your own state. So this is, this is how the thinking, um, uh, security thinking uh, goes. So you're basically giving them more rights means that you will uh, destroy the, the state. 
uh, because they are cooperating with the enemy, with the kin state who is an enemy, and the kin state's interest is to to destroy your democracy and to destroy your independence or, or sovereignty. So this is the uh, this is a dilemma in a way that uh, how to continuously empower the minority still and not to um, um, how to say um, and, and in in this highly securitized uh, highly securitized uh, discourse about the minority. So this is the. This is and securitization. I mean by securitization is that um, it's it's a it's a state uh, sovereignty security question whether the state can be sovereign uh, and can govern its own uh, processes compared to another country interfering and controlling it. And here you have a huge difference with the South Tyrol, for example, because Russia as a kin state uh, has has claimed the minority. Russian minority outside of the Russian Federation as its own nation. So there is a clear claim to put among on by Russian state saying a Russian nation is bigger than the Russian territory. So Russian nation also lives outside of the Russian territory. These are our uh, citizens, our co-ethnics, our compatriots as they call them. And this claim is securitizing the situation uh, uh, quite significantly. So the reaction of the nation states where the minority lives is that uh, you have apparently your fifth column inside of my country. So this is the, what I mean by how the minority is securitized in the, in the Baltic states in Estonia and, um, and Latvia. And the role of the EU, uh, well, there was uh, David Smith, I can hear is, is, is listening here. Uh, in early 2000s, there was hopes that uh, by Baltic states joining the EU, the, that will desecuritize the, the situation, or Baltic states joining NATO, that this will desecuritize uh, the minority situation. Well, this has not happened. This has not happened, and EU uh, uh, membership of EU or membership of NATO does not provide um, this kind of a, a guarantee um, uh, that would allow that would you know change the securitization uh, discourse inside of the of the Baltic states vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russian minority and Russia. So, and and of course the Ukrainian events in Ukraine have actually even uh, um, kind of enlarged these concerns uh, about Russia and about the Russian minority. Thank you, Christina. Who wants to go next? No. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. I, I really think that your questions are really fitting for, for our session today. Uh, I, I would like to, to comment briefly three aspects. No, the first one re related with regard to the European Union uh, influence no, on all this. And I would say that for, from the point of view of Spain, no, when Spain enters in the European communities and then in the European Union immediately, uh, uh, the standards of protection of minorities in, in Spain was already, I would say, above, the, for instance, the, the Council of Europe standards. So from this point of view, um, neither Basque or Catalans have a special expectations in terms of gaining a special or additional protection to their minority rights, uh, let's say, in that way. Because they already have uh, very important powers within the Spanish autonomous system, autonomous community system, for instance, uh, Basque language or Catalan language as the main language in education, a warranty not only in primary school, but even in the mid uh, high school no? and, and university studies as well. Um, and others. No? So what they have a lot of expectations were not about this, because they were at that time no, proud of their own powers no, in the new system. But more the, the expectations were much more placed in, in, in the stand in which the Catalan government or the Basque government will be able to participate directly or indirectly in European policy making in a way that solve or solve be that was the expectation, no? respectful with the internal distribution of powers existing in Spain. So a sort of solution like the Belgian solution, no? the Belgian solution in for internal, in for external. So for those powers that are exclusive for the base of Catalan governments, or even shared powers with the central government to participate formally in decision making. And the Treaty of Maastricht, of course, uh, opened the possibility for this through a number of venues. 
but it was clear no, that despite the potential, the gatekeepers remain main states. No? And in contrast, for instance, with Austria, in contrast with uh, Germany, Belgium, and even Italy, Spain never uh, uh, approached a serious uh, constitutional revision in order to make more fitting Spanish constitutional distribution of powers and, and institutional venues for intergovernmental coordination to the potential of the European Union. And as a result of this, what happens is perhaps that Basque nationalists and Catalan nationalists became increasingly disappointed with the, with the scope and limits of, of the European Union as a frame, a new frame for them. And both of them are right now quite vindicative of an special status to be recognized for what they call constitutional regions or regions with uh, legislative powers, so, which is basically the reformulation of this group, no? the coalition of Rechler, those European regions no? with legislative powers. But now they have re renewed this, this or re refound in some way this, refunding this for a core group of uh, regions with sound and very serious and resourceful institutional resources and powers. With regard to the euro region, uh, happens also something different to other cases, for instance, in Eastern Europe, no? in which the, the previous comment also is valid. No? How the expectations for minority protection in Eastern Europe and Central Europe was high, and Spain was not so spectacular. But in terms of the euro region, it happens that in this case, for instance, we don't have any keen state. No? Uh, France is uh, formally against even the recognition of a formal Basque region, of a formal Catalan region in, in France. Uh, Catalan language and Basque language even today is tolerated, is, 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 is possible to study in French, sorry, in Basque, in Catalan, in, in, in the French and Catalan and side, no? and the Basque uh, Catalan, French side. But this language is still not being recognized as official. For instance, the students for entering university, they need to do their examinations in French. It's impossible to do that in Catalan or in, in, in Basque. In Spain, it's not like this. Huh? So from this point of view, neither Basque nationalists and Catalan nationalists have real interest in the potential of the Euro regions because they lack of a Catalan or Basque interlocutor on the other side of the border. Huh? So from this point of view, they have been interested at the beginning, but later became disappointed. Eh? And the sole effect that the activation of, I will say, of Basque autonomy and also the activation of uh, close relationships between Navarra and the Basque country has had in, in terms of recognizing you know, the territoriality, at least of Basque culture, no? has been the, I would say, that the Basque government, the French government, uh, allow for the creation of an informal assembly of, of, of Basque municipal, mu municipios, uh, cities, uh, uh, local governments in, in the in the in Iparralde, no, in the French uh, uh, Basque country. So, Euro region is not a promising thing for Basque nationalists or uh, or uh, Catalan nationalists. Um, what they are quite insistent, and they are a little bit as a small keen para states trying to promote Basque and Catalan culture in France. And for instance, the Basque government endorsed the, the expenses for securing that Basque television and radio broadcasting uh, reach, reaches no, uh, the south of France uh, with all the, the infrastructures paid by the Basque government in, in, in Spain no, without any support of the French government. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's different to the case of other minorities no, across Europe. And finally, I appreciate very much the, the clarification you asked for no, about securitization. No? Of course, securitization as a scholarly thing uh, begins no, basically as an understanding of how discourse uh, may evolve in a way that securitizes things and then has some performing effects, no, some performative effects. But um, to speak about securitization, forgetting absolutely any other dimension, non-discursive dimension of, of, of security, I would say is, is, use, is, is useless. No? For instance, in the case of the Basque country, terrorism has been a serious thing. The, the border has been a highly securitized border in the most empirical sense of the word, but also discursively. Uh, in terms of the discourse of uh, special anti-terrorist laws, for instance, during the 80s and early 90s, in terms of how, for instance, the French government has been very careful not to mention the notion of Basque in any institutional document no, in the French Republic. 
So it's, it's, it's something I would say that predates, no? I would say the securitization school, no? but uh, in, in, in some way, the, the, the paradox of the Basque and Catalan case is that just when the Basque uh, community, the Basque country, escapes from this securitization discursive and performative effects, Catalonia is falling a little bit on this. No? And it's falling not only as a result of the reaction of the Spanish uh, government it's, it, or the reaction of the European Union as a container no, of uh, further ambitions for independence for Catalonia, but also because they enter in security situation as well, as well because uh, they, the, the leaders of the Catalan process put a clear emphasis in, 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 in creating a representation of things as an, an unaffordable as a violent, rep, highly repressive state. Uh, so securitization and broadcasting across the world about uh, situations of uh, political turmoil and political or policial repression in the streets and so on was part of the process as well. So securitization in its discursive effects has been, and uh, his consequences, at the end, uh, extremely costly for Catalan nationalism. Now they are trying to escape from this discourse, huh? and it's not so easy to do that. No, but I would say that this is. A, I really like the, the way you formulate the question, and I am I'm thinking that as, I, as now I am in our research group, no, that we are talking, discussing on these issues. I would like very much to develop this this double sense of securitization in the Catalan and the Basque thing. Thank you, Andrea. Thank to you for this further clarification and uh, in-depth view in your uh, in Catalonian Basque uh, case. And uh, Andrea, you are last but not least. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, there is not much I can I could add to what Christina and uh, Noya has already mentioned, except to uh, highlight that for Romania, the EU played a very important role. So those minority policies. Uh, are still in place, uh, 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 have been, uh, were implemented in the countries, were implemented during the accession process. Not much has been done since 2006, 2007, in terms of, um, um, the, uh, in terms of improving the accommodation of national minorities and in particular that of the Hungarian minority. The only change that happened since, or significant change was an increase in state funding uh, for national minorities, but the increase is um, not so significant. Um, your second question, Andrea, to what extent cross-border cooperation can contribute to create a share space and Furthermore, to desecuritization. Um, in the in the case of uh, Romania and Hungary, um, there is already cross border cooperation um, that um, um, that exists, but not um, uh, not perhaps not in the sense. Uh, that uh, or, uh, in the sense that it was defined by the European Union, and meaning as non-state institutionalized practices. Uh, unfortunately, in, in in the case of the of the two border of the borders between Romania and Hungary, both states have been very much involved in uh, creating those institutions. Uh, there is also, of course, uh, uh, there is cooperation at the individual level between communities living on both sides of the borders, etc. So that exists. Now the problem remains those. Um, um, the problem remains setting up those uh, or allowing those organizations there or institutions there to uh, uh, to. Uh, cooperate even further or just to encourage local actions, etc., which is something that uh, on which uh, Romania and Hungary are, seem to be uh, a little bit behind. And regarding your last question, what's the meaning of securitization? I thought I avoided uh, the use of securitizations, but no, I know I used it twice in, in my presentation. Uh, I'm um, the sense. Um, the sense in which um, 
I used it uh, in uh, in my presentation as um, as opposed to addressing um, um, minority rights as a matter of justice, uh, but as a um, just basically, I was building on the dichotomy that uh, Kim uh put forth with his security and justice. Um, now, more broadly, uh, I think securitization refers to uh, an attempt to remove issues from the public debate and um, take ad hoc decisions or, um, so, or, or um, implement solutions without public consultation. Um, now, the, in the case of Romania, uh, the securitization of minority rights in the early 1990s meant that uh, they were not much discussed, if at all, in different and different periods of time at the start of the transition period. Thank you. Thanks, thanks to you for uh, all these uh, comments and reply to. Sorry, uh, please. What's uh to my question, which I hope they make sense to you. So I, we are still 15 minutes. So I was going to open the floor to the public who is assisting to us. And uh, indeed, I just see a question uh, has been put on the chat. I remember, I remind again, everybody that uh, is, if you have a question, please write the question in the chat. So I'm going to read it. Uh, is a question for uh, Christina specifically. Uh, do you see, I don't know if you, Christina, also you see the question in the chat. Yes, yes, I yeah, read okay. it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read the question anyway. Do you see as possible development and increasing split within the Russian speaking communities in Estonia and Latvia in the sense that Russian speaking Ukrainian for the two states will cut ties with Russia and will strengthen their connection with the democratic Ukraine? which might lead in long term to a lesser level of securitization on this particular part of Russian speaking population of the two countries? Uh, yes, well, um, this uh, split among the Russian speaking population is not along the ethnic lines. It's not that Ukrainians and Belarusians are on one side and the Russians on the other side. We have uh, Ukrainians or you know people who identify themselves ethnically as Ukrainians, but speak Russian as a main language and support very much Russia. And, and we have ethnic Russians uh, who support very much Ukraine. So you can't, you can't split um, this uh, population, this part of the population along the ethnic lines. Uh, what, you, what we do see, and this, we don't have a public uh, data on Estonia, but we have a uh, public data on Latvia. And I think the situation in Estonia is the same. So there was a question asked from the Russian speaking population of Latvia about whom do you support in this war? And, um, and you had 20% of uh, Russian speakers who said that they support Russia. They think Russia is doing the right thing and, and that's what they, so they, they support. 25% uh, said that they support Ukraine, that they are on the Ukrainian side and, and Russia is an aggressor. And 46% of the Russian speakers in Latvia said uh, neither nor. So they don't support neither Russia nor Ukraine. And this is much more interesting um, is what about this 46%? Uh, what's, what's their um, uh, positioning vis-a-vis -vis Russia, positioning vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and vis-a-vis -vis -vis Latvia, for example? And it's not clear until we do some kind of um, uh, qualitative research because this was just a survey. We don't know what's behind this neither nor uh, positioning, but uh, we can't say, for example, that a majority of the Russian speakers support Russia. We can't say that. It's, it's probably not the case. We also can't say that majority support Ukraine. You have a majority who does not want to take any position actually, or doesn't want to take any side in this. And it's about, you know, time will tell what, what exactly is happening there, but it's not along the, um, it's not along the ethnic lines. Uh, this division is not along the ethnic lines. Thank you, Christina. Uh, let me see, I don't see other questions coming from the chat at this moment. So if uh, in case I will actually have, a, have another question, uh, which is, uh, I mean, is, another, is one of the concept, but first of all, sorry, a specific question for Noe, which I have, I have, it doesn't happen many times that we have someone working on both Catalonia and Basque country in a comparative way, as you mentioned. And uh, to me, it's always surprising 
I mean, I remember reading this long time ago, 20 years ago, this book, Multinational Democracies, where Catalonia was the class, the model of the multinational democracy, Catalonia with the relation with Spain, where the Basque country were like the more or less the bad example, the ethnic nationalist, the example of ethnic nationalists. And now 20 years later, uh, the situation is reversed. So if you can uh, uh, explain, if what's your point of view on this, how, why they happen, how things have changed in the way. And then uh, for uh, Maria Andrea and Cristina, uh, if you see, we have 10 minutes uh, really fast. So we talk about another uh, uh, actor we didn't mention, I mean, you mentioned representation, but we didn't use, it's the King State. And uh, we know at King State, but first of all, to what extent the King State have a really genuine interest in protecting national minorities? Of course, we can question that. We know Russia is Russia's genuine interest in protecting Russian speakers, or uh, I, I'm not sure about even Austria. I'm not sure uh, it was the genuine interest that sometimes um, can take some decisions which are not really in the interest of South Tyrol uh, sometimes. Uh, so actually, then we're going to ask uh, how we want to we, we want to do with securitization, whatever you understand securitization. But sometimes maybe we should uh, deal with uh, we should uh, the goal should be to desecretize the king state rather than focus on the minority. Is that make sense? Is this is it especially possible to desecretize this way? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm trying. I'm. Uh, I'm not sure. It makes sense with my question. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. But I'm, I stop here because we only have uh, nine minutes left. So Noah, if you want to answer first, and then maybe Andrea and Christina can give a last. Uh... We cannot hear you. The mic, not for not for not disturbing <laughs> the session. Okay, so I, I must say, Andreas, that your, your comment no, about how I understand no, this uh, paradoxical evolution or paradoxical e evolution in the Basque and Catalan cases is, is a question that we in the Basque country and in, in Catalonia and whole Spain, we also uh, have this, this question, you know, why? Because on the one hand, as I try to emphasize, no, the origins are quite similar. Um, despite many other differences, um, the experience of the um, Statute of Autonomy no? during the Second Republic in Spain, the, the experience of dictatorship, of exile, the, 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 also, for instance, the presence of a sort of moderate, the possibilities, possibilities and uh, I would say pragmatic nationalism, but also some, I would say, more strained, more independent this branch you know, in both Basque and Catalan nationalists were things that were quite similar. No? So, in my view, uh, I would say that the, the explanatory variable that um, perhaps explains this no, better than others is political leadership, political leadership and emotional climate. It is a notion that in political science not widely is not widely used, but in, for instance, in social psychology is quite common. No, the, the idea of a society's experience a particular and changing emotional climates. So it seems to me that in the case of the Basque country. Uh, Ivar Reche, you know, with his project of uh, his project of creating a free state yeah. association with Spain, was uh, despite his ambition, uh, I would say his uh, idealism was quite self-restrained. In no moment, uh, Ivar Reche overly defied, defied or, or challenged the Spanish constitutional system. At the end, he he delivered the project formally, registered the project in the Spanish Congress, and he was there defending the project, and he he lost the, the votation in the Spanish Congress, and the whole history ends. Also, he was a sort of uh, sportively recognizing his defeat, which was a proposal which creates a lot of expectations in the Basque country, but not an unanimous expectation. It's nothing comparable, for instance, with the independence of the Baltic states, for instance. No, it was not a sort of un all all the nation unanimously in favor of independence, but it was quite important in terms of testing the limits of the Spanish system. But the Catalan thing evolves in a very different way. On the, on the one hand, they have the experience of the Basque case, but on the other hand, they have a clear determination to go further, to move forward more audacious, uh, 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 with more audacious, no? more audaciously. And perhaps the, the element of leadership operates in a very different way. I'm uh, trying to be honest no, with you all. I would say that in, in, in a particular moment, 
uh, in which the Catalan politics were in a quite messy situation with situations of corruption, with situations where it's increasingly difficult to secure a majority in the Catalan parliament. The decision of the Spanish constitutional court to modify you know, the, the Catalan statute was something that uh, is uh, clearly something, of course, that was disappointing for those uh, sponsoring you know, this project, but was overemphasized, was uh, a, a, an element that uh, facilitated the recomposition of uh, Catalan politics in terms of a new divide, you know, those in favor of uh, going forward and those against of going forward. And this social polarization in Catalonia has evolved in a sort of uh, apparently friendly way, non-violent way, peaceful means always, no, no terrorists, no, nothing of this, but has created a real divide in Catalan society. And this, uh, this is a little bit what uh, I would say, delimitate the, the, the limits. No? In the case of the Basque country, what happens was, was quite the opposite, just the opposite, I must say, that Ibarreche realized the polarization of Basque society and the very Basque Nationalist Party immediately tried to avoid this polarization because the, the, there is a really balanced situation between those sponsoring you know, independence and those, I would say, comfortable you know, within Spain. And in my view, this uh, political leadership, this, uh, the, 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 the use of this uh, emotional climate was more risky and more, I would say, imprudent in the most Aristotelic sense of the word, less prudential in the case of Catalan political elites than in the case of the Basque political elites. Finally, uh, Basque nationalists was really disappointed with the outcome of the crisis in Catalonia because uh, personally, the Lenda Cari Urcuyu negotiated with Puigdemont the possibility of a, uh, of a resignation and the call for elections. And despite this uh, personal agreement they, they acquired, uh, Puigdemont ignored this previous agreement after uh, the situation in which even the Basque president in a press conference um, announces this agreement uh, as a deal, no, that so will be respect for all, no. So this has created a split between Bas and Catalan nationalists, and the pragmatic uh, position of Urcuyo today, the, the president and the Bas Nationalist Party, I would say, is is pragmatic, but it's assertive in the old vindications, but absolutely avoiding any unnecessary or imprudential risk. And in Catalonia, they are trying to recover the. The, the the path no the mm -hmm. recover and 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 this is paradoxical i would say because the radicalism was of course a bad thing no no a catalan thing thank you no actually yeah. i think we have only three minutes okay. left actually i was going to say to christina andrea sorry discharge my previous question because we have a specific question from the public i want to give priority with what the public asks so uh, is a question for andrea uh, do you know if uh, or to what extent Romanians resent Hungary's financial aid programs to Hungarians in Romania? Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm afraid I don't. There was some uh, there was some research done a few years back that showed that there is some resentment between Romanians and Hungarians, but I haven't seen anything new uh, in relation to uh, uh, Hungary's kin state policy. Sergio would like, would like to answer this question. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Sergio. Go ahead, Sergio. Um, yes, sorry. I in fact, <laughs> I probably I pushed the wrong button. I just wanted to comment on the on the chat, but apparently I was um, uh, not doing the right thing. So I just wanted to to say that in fact um, it is clearly. Uh, that this um, increasing financial support uh, from the Hungarian government to the hung ma Hungarian minority in Romania that Andrea showed uh, in her presentation came with a price over the years. And um, there's um, uh, clear evidence there were uh, journalistic and um, uh, um, say, um, say investigation on this uh, on the level on the high level of uh, total control almost that um, the Hungarian government or proxies of Hungarian government um, have on on the Hungarian language media in in Romania and Transylvania. So uh, nowadays, probably uh, few will dispute the claim that there are very few, let's say, independent uh, newspapers or. Uh, 
publications in Hungarian language in, in Romania. Uh, so this kind of publications that uh, are available to the large public are mostly repeating or reflecting the views of the Hungarian government. And I think this is also quite interesting to, to basically to maybe as a potential uh, future, let's say, uh, uh, issue of research um, to see whether how this, uh, let's say, um, uh, message is coming from Budapest, for example, regarding the, um, the war in Ukraine. Um, uh, are then uh, received by the Hungarians from Romania because uh, one thing that uh, at least this is my my impression that it was different was uh, the approach towards the war in Ukraine was different in Transylvania and Romania so uh, also the level of political leadership of uh, Hungarian minority in Romania there was clearly immediate um, condemnation of Russia and uh, uh, well, we all know that the position of, of the Hungarian government uh, raised some questions when it comes to, to its, uh, let's say, approach towards the, the war, the Russian uh, invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. So, yes, uh, there, there is some um, clearly some um, uh, concern there, uh, whether there is a concern at the level of general population, I don't know, but I think at the level of, let's say, Romanian political elites, uh, more and more this idea that uh, uh, this kind of de facto outsourcing minority Hungarian minority protection to Hungary over the last years, just uh, being happy that Hungary spends money on, on uh, you know, Hungarian cultural institutions, media and so on and so forth, in fact, uh, proved to be uh, a kind of... Um, I say counterproductive uh, from this, from the perspective of, uh, let's say, uh, of the Romanian state. And who knows, maybe in long term, this might create again this kind of trends of securitization for the securitization uh, when it comes to the relations between uh, the state, Romanian state, and the Hungarian minority in Romania. Thank you. Thanks, Sergio, for uh, this, uh, uh, this. Uh... Last comment. Luckily, we get to the end of the webinar. It's six thirty. I was hoping to give a just for last word to Christina. If you have a really short last comments, otherwise, if you are not, uh, I will uh, stop here. And again, thank you all to the speaker for this really excellent uh, discussion and exchange of perspective on the concept of empowering securitization part of diplomacy in the tournament and minorities and I uh, hope, uh, hope they also our public enjoy our conversation and uh, please stay tuned for the next uh, webinar within the webinar series on South Tyrol and Tormi. just uh, check on our website thank you bye thank you so much to you all thank you bye 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 bye